Hey, good night. It's Presse here. Thanks for joining me in the workshop today. Now, this is episode nine on building the Mixi Clock playlists up here. If you want to go back and look at the other episodes, and I know what you're thinking. Episode nine is this ever going to end? Well, yes, it is. We're getting close. <laughs> Still a couple to go. Today's episode is about getting ready to fit the guts inside this clock. Now, the guts, surprisingly, is this little tiny thing here. This is a Node MCU. It's a Wi-Fi enabled microcontroller. It does all of the timekeeping function for the clock and also allows the display to happen in the front of the clock as well. And in order to get the guts inside the clock I need to make the screen. Now the screen is in two parts. It's a clear acrylic screen which is sandblasted on one side to create a sort of a diffuser and then over the top of that we're going to fit this very fine stainless steel mesh. That's just purely decorative to give it that steampunk look. And I've made a number of these clocks before with the same basic electronics, but they've been built in different styles. So one of them was like a mid-century modern style, uh, which I called a Vixie, and the other one was a sort of a, a Victorian-inspired style, which I gave to one of my collaborators. Uh, this one, though, full-on steampunk and uh, in today's episode we're also going to get the power from the cast aluminium base up to the clock case itself. We're going to look at some of the, the back of the clock, getting the switch panel in and so on. And at that point, after today's episode, the whole clock is coming apart, both of them, and I need to do all the preparation for finishing. And that's going to involve a lot of powder coating, polishing, some woodworking finishes on the case itself and then the whole clock can come back together again and I can reveal a feature <laughs> that I've been working on in the background for a long time now and uh, finally got it working last night. So I can go ahead and include that and you'll probably figure out what it is along the way but I'm not gonna mention it uh, explicitly just yet. We'll see if you can work it out. Okay, so let's get busy. Let's get on to the first part which is getting the power from the base to the clock case. If you recall back to one of the earlier episodes, I drilled and counterbored for a 5 volt DC power socket in this cast aluminium base here. And the idea was that the wire from that socket would come up through one of these T fittings, through the tube, in through this end of the clock here. But that was a bit of a problem. To get the wire through this banjo fitting and into the clock body was a bit of a mission. So I decided against that and instead I'm going to use one of these flexible rubber plumbing fittings. Now these are designed for things like kitchen sink mixers or bathroom mixers. They're quite flexible, uh, they're pressure tight. This end has a 5 16 UNF thread on it, or at least I think that's what it is. And this end's got a sort of a hex nut on it as well. But it's way too long and I'll need to shorten this to make it do what I want to do. So the idea was that it would come out through a hole about there somewhere and it's going to flex around and then go in through that plastic panel there. Now this is the switch panel, it also carries a hole for the USB port but unfortunately now this is scrap <laughs> because there's no room for a hole to take that braided stainless steel tube. So uh, first job is to shorten this, so I put a mark on there where I think it needs to be cut. So let's go ahead and give that a try, but it means cutting through this stainless steel braid. So this is the end that I'll be keeping and there's my mark there, and I'm going to cut this just a little bit over length. Now, <laughs> this is what I'm going to use, it's a little junior hacksaw. I don't think cutting that with uh, any sort of uh, a cutting edge like a, like a wire cutter is going to work, I think it'll just squish it. So let's try this. bit messy but what I think I can do is sort of pull that back and then shorten the tube so I'll just compress that braided stainless steel up a bit I'll cut this off just a bit shorter and then I can sort of burr over that stainless steel mesh All right, 
out. So you can sort of just tidy that up now. I'm going to get a pair of snips and just cut off the little frayed ends there. So we got a nice clean end on that. Now in order to make this look neat, I'm going to make a brass fitting to go on here. But let me get this cleaned up first and I'll show you what I have. Uh, it's not the neatest end in the world, but as you see in a minute, I can cover that up with a, a ferrule. So off camera, I made this little brass fitting. Now it's got a, a nut on this end here, and that'll allow that to tighten up on that plastic panel at the back there. And this end here has been bored out, so it's a pretty tight fit on that stainless steel braid. Now the trick, of course, is trying to coax the stainless steel braid inside that without allowing it to you know, burr over and fur up on the end there. So um, let's, let's give that a try and see what happens. It's really hard to show what I'm trying to do here, but I've got these little stray bits of stainless steel wire that don't want to go in. And you just got to sort of squish them up against the rubber. And I think I've got that, or well, very close anyway. So let's just push that in there. Alright, so that's looking pretty neat. And yes, it was a struggle. <laughs> I didn't show it all on the camera. Uh, it's starting to get a bit frustrating. But what I'll do now is I'll put some super glue in there, some cyanoacrylate, and it'll just sort of bond the wire to the rubber and the wire to the brass. And that'll be more or less a permanent feature then. So let's do that. So I just want a couple of drops here. And that glue will wick inside the stainless steel. It'll bond everything together. All right, that's it. So what we need to do now is to get this end drilled and threaded into the cast aluminium base. I've decided that that drill hole needs to be at 60 degrees off the baseline here. So I've got my protractor set to that, but it's awkward because of the shape of that casting. So not going to do it that way. What I really want to have is the exact center of this edge of the base and the exact center of the length of the base. So we'll get those marked on there. With one of these little vernier marking gauges I can get a dimension off that area there which is roughly where our hole is going to go. According to this, that's uh, 138.4, so we'll go to half of that. But then all you really want to do is sort of scratch that mark from both ends, and if they coincide then you've got the exact centre. So we're in that area there. All right. With this one I'm just estimating and then splitting the difference. All right, that, because of that geometry there, that's made a sort of a V-shaped mark, but that's my centre there. All right, so we're going to go over the mill and we'll set this up for drilling. All right, don't laugh, but <laughs> these are my rough and ready angle blocks. So this is set to a 30 degree angle to the base of the vise. It's just cut from some softwood and that'll allow the casting to sit back at the required angle and then we're just going to set this uh, center finder to the very center of the bottom edge of the casting and then we can come up and over and then find our center uh, on the length and then we'll drill there. Okay, I reckon that's close enough, so now we're going to go up and over. And 
my casting isn't clamped down here so when we get started I can just position the casting underneath the drill bit and spot that hole and then we'll open it up with a thread. That drilled hole that I just did is the correct size for the pilot on that spot drill or spot facing tool. Now we're going to open it out to 6.9 millimeters, which is our tapping size for the thread. Now unfortunately the only tap that I have is a bottom tap and in this soft aluminium I think it's going to work okay but uh, yeah it would be nice if I had a taper tap to get that started I'm having to press down fairly hard to get that to bite and there it goes that's through there now Okay, so we got power in, power out. So there's our connector for the power and that'll go through that back panel. So I guess that's the next thing we gotta do is make a new one of those. Well, there's the original switch panel that didn't really work out. Here's a new one, and this is where the power will be going in here. And I've cut a little washer to go behind that as well. And these guys over here, I'll be talking more about them later, but they were instrumental in helping me with this project. So what we've done is just smooth the switches up. We've got some room now for the power to go in here. What I found with this uh, two-ply plastic after you've engraved it is you get a quite a, a large raised burr on that edge. And just using a blade, you can go around and just scrape that off. And it exposes some of the, the white core of the plastic as well, which makes it look a bit neater around the edge there. And when you can't feel that raised edge anymore, you can just stop there. I also clean the surface of the, the black here with some, uh, like an abrasive cleaner, like uh, GIF or Ajax, whatever you like to call it. And you always get a bit of like smoke that stains that surface there, but it comes off quite easily. Okay, I'm gonna get this cleaned up here and then we'll try this in place on the cloth body. Let's see how it looks.
can see that I've gone right around the edges and just taken all the burrs off, all the internal openings as well. And it looks a lot neater when you expose that white edge from the front there. So a piece of tube now will fit through that bottom hole there. And we've got our washer to go on. And our nut. So it's sort of like that, and this is going to fit into that opening there with a couple of round head screws just at either end there, and our piece of tube can bend around and go into the base. Now while I've got the laser out, I'm also going to cut the acrylic screen to go in the front of the clock here. So this is just some 3mm clear acrylic. I already have the DXF file from when I cut the opening in the front of the clock body. So I am just use that to cut the same shape from the 3mm acrylic. And it's going to get sandblasted on the back side and we'll be doing that soon. So here's that screen and I've still got the protective paper on that. I also uh, decided to cut this again actually and I included the holes in either end to allow this to be screwed into the clock frame. I'm going to leave the protective paper on that until right at the end um, but what we need to do now is to cut the same shape from this stainless steel mesh. Now the problem with this stuff is that it's not welded together so the little strands right on the end here can be unwoven and when we cut this curve shape here there's a danger that these little tiny pieces right on the end here are going to simply fall out so I've got to be a little bit uh, careful about doing that so that's the next step I was sort of thinking that the easiest way to do this is to hold this together with some tape and this will also allow me to trace the shape of the screen onto the mesh Alright, so that tape should hold all the mesh together, all the individual strands, uh, at least temporarily until we can get this shape cut out. So here's my acrylic screen. I'm going to put that on there, but I'm going to line it up with the already guillotined edge. So I don't have to cut that one. Okay, pretty good. So I think I'm going to trace around this with the biro. I think a sharpie would make too thick a mark. So there's our outline and I'm just going to use an ordinary pair of tin snips to cut this. So I'm just going to trim off most of the waste first. good thing to do when you're cutting any sort of material with snips like this is just go around and remove most of the waste. Otherwise you're trying to contend with um, bits of waste get curled up and they get caught in the snips and it's a bit of a pain really. It sort of influences where the, where the cut line goes. Right so there's our rough outline there so now I need to be a lot more careful and try and follow that curve around there. I just want to turn that over you can see how some of these strands are very very short. I was a bit lucky there this one's fairly long and because it's woven into the mesh it'll sort of hold there because it's all kinked into place. But I don't want that to come out. And I think you can hear that it's not quite like cutting sheet material. You're cutting individual strands of stainless steel here. So it's a bit notchy. It's a bit hard to predict where it's going to cut. Once again, you can see that one there is very short. If only brains, it would have centered the actual pattern of the mesh 
uh, on the, the shape that I'm trying to produce here, but I yeah, didn't do it. <laughs> Is anyone going to notice? Well, you will. All right, that's sort of fairly disaster free. Happy with that. But once again, I'm going to leave that tape on uh, until the last minute, really. Just took this in next door and I ran this around the belt sander just to take off all little burrs and little stray bits of wire. And that should be a fairly tight press fit in that opening. Now the acrylic screen does have a pair of screw holes at either end and they'll screw into these little tabs. And then the mesh will fit over the top of that. Now the next step is to sandblast the back of this acrylic screen. Now that is what provides the diffusion. So when you're looking through that, you're not looking directly at the LEDs, you're actually looking at a lit up panel corresponding to one of those seven segments. Now while I have the sandblaster out, I'm going to dismantle the whole clock and we're going to start prepping these castings. So they need to be uh, roughened up a bit so the powder coat will adhere really well. And it also helps to remove some of this sort of texture that's already on the casting. So I'll do that and also while the clock's apart I'm going to start doing the prep on the, the wooden carcass. So I think I'm going to be doing a combination of French polish and a single pack lacquer to finish that up. A little job to do up here which we'll talk about later. <laughs> and uh, yeah so from now on it's all going to be in bits and I'm also going to get all these copper and brass parts all cleaned up. I haven't decided what to do about those yet. They're going to oxidize if I do nothing. So we may end up using probably a wax to help prevent the oxide on the surface of that material. I'm just going to put these screens in one at a time. Uh, I've left the paper on the other side there because I don't want that side to have any texture on that at all. And I guess the most important thing with this side here is that we cover this in a uniform pattern. Uh, we don't want to have any difference in the, the texture because when you see the digit showing through that from the other side, you'll notice it. So I'm just going to be very precise and work backwards and forwards. Not sure if you noticed, but I was trying to do that in a zigzag pattern uh, from both sides, running lengthways and then crossways and then diagonally. And then I gripped it by the edges and went all over it again. Um, I did notice that when I had my thumb there, it left a sort of like a clear patch. So uh, gripping it by the edges sort of gets rid of that uh, yeah, mistake, I guess. <laughs> and until I take the paper off this, it's a bit hard to tell. But I guess I can cover this back up again with uh, tape if I have to put it back in. Trouble with this acrylic is when it gets a bit old, this paper doesn't want to come off very easily. And it's even worse if you store this stuff anywhere near sunlight. It just seems to bake the paper on. This is starting to get that way. It's starting to be very hard to remove the, the backing. Well, that looks uniform to me. Uh, let's put a light behind it and just see whether we can see any sort of differences in the texture. I guess in a way you can't overdo it, you could underdo it. <laughs> you could have patches where there is still the shiny surface of the acrylic. But just looking at that now with the light behind it, it looks pretty good. And yes, I know you can buy acrylic with this texture already on it. Uh, I just didn't have any. I did have the clear though and this uh, I don't know, just, that's fine. It'll work. 
Well, as you can see, the whole clock has come apart now and it's going to stay that way until I've done all of the finishing processes on all of the parts. But here's the acrylic screen that we made. Now that's going to get held in with a couple of uh, countersunk head screws at either end. Here's the mesh screen and it's just a press fit. Now the little stainless steel wires that protrude out of the ends there sort of grip on the edge of that timber opening there. And although that won't fall out, it's a bit rattly. And what I'm planning to do here now is to fit some tiny little 12BA round head screws in a few strategic places. They'll screw directly to the acrylic. And the reasoning was I didn't want to glue this in. I want to be able to take the mesh out in case I get dirt or dust or anything behind the mesh there. You really want to remove it to clean it. So I think that's the plan. Now I'm going to finish up today's video here. I think we've seen enough. And I'm going to leave you with some wildlife photos. These were some birds that I spotted out in the backyard the other day that you may not have seen before. And for today's video, thanks for watching. Uh, I'm going to catch you on the next one. Probably two or maybe three episodes to go. And I've got um, a, a really, really cool feature to show you, which I know is working now. Um, and we're going to see it coming up. And it'll blow you away, I guarantee it. But for today, thanks for watching, and uh, I'll see you on the next video. Preso, signing up. Catch you on the next one.